Topology is so important. The quality of a mesh determines how well it renders and how well it animates. A lot of models today are created by either photo scanning or sculpting, and in both of those cases, the resulting mesh is extremely dense, inefficient, and not suitable for animation or a game engine. So we use a process called retopology to create a simplified version of the mesh that's ready for any kind of animation or rendering. There are essentially two types of retopology, automatic and custom. Auto retopology simplifies a mesh for you based on an algorithm and a few parameters. Some algorithms are fairly simple and fast, like collapsing dense or flat areas into larger triangles, while others are more complex and slow, like generating quads that follow the curvature of a surface. Automatic retopology is generally great for background objects that don't have to deform, like rocks and statues. The downside of automatic retopology is that you have little to no control over where each point is placed. For objects that move and deform, such as animals and characters, that kind of control is crucial for building topological support for the intended movement. So artists lay down new geometry, polygon by polygon, point by point, until they have the exact mesh that they need. The result is a mesh that's maximally tailored for its intended purpose, but it's also fairly tedious and time-consuming to create. The RetopoFlow add-on for Blender aims to make custom retopology a lot less tedious and actually pretty fun by adding a new retopology mode to Blender that includes sketch-based tools that allow you to draw out new topology in a fast, fluid way. I'm Jonathan Lampel with cgcookie.com, and this course is a full guide to using RetopoFlow in Blender. To get RetopoFlow, you can purchase a copy from the Blender market, or for educational use, find it on our GitHub. To get the models we'll be using as examples, check out this course on cgcookie.com. Links are in the description. You can install RetopoFlow like any other Blender add-on. Just head to Edit and Preferences, over to Add-ons, click Install, navigate to the RetopoFlow.zip file. Just as a heads up, do not unzip it before installing. Then click Install Add-on. Then just check the box to enable the add-on and save your preferences. If you have any issues with installation, just be sure to check our documentation to make sure that you have the right version of RetopoFlow for your version of Blender. Now, at the moment, RetopoFlow is essentially an app that runs inside of, but separate from the rest of Blender. This allows us to get around some of the key limitations when it comes to Blender and Retopology, but we know it's not convenient to have the wall between the two. So we are working on a new version of RetopoFlow that integrates more seamlessly with the rest of Blender, but it's quite a big project, and there's a few things to work out still before that can become a reality. With RetopoFlow enabled, you'll find a new menu in the 3D View header, where you can start RetopoFlow, read the documentation in Blender or on the web, customize the RetopoFlow shortcuts, open an autosave, or check for updates. To start RetopoFlow, you just need to have any object that you want to snap to, which we'll call a source, visible in the viewport. If nothing is visible, then you won't be able to start RetopoFlow, because then the new geometry won't have anything to snap to. If you have a lot of objects in the scene, I would recommend organizing them into collections and disabling the collection for everything that you don't want to retopologize. Or you can select the objects that you want to focus on and hit slash to go into local view. That works as well. Now the new low poly object that will be the result of the retopology process is called the target. You can create a new target by going to the RetopoFlow menu in the 3D view header and choosing to either create one at the 3D cursor or at the active object. Let's create one at the 3D cursor. This will also launch RetopoFlow. It may take a second for RetopoFlow to load the first time, but subsequent loads will be faster. When we are able to integrate the tools into Blender more natively, this load time should go away entirely. Now, once RetopoFlow starts, you'll get a welcome screen with information about how to use it and links to the documentation. Read that if you'd like, and then uncheck this box at the top if you don't want this to show up when RetopoFlow starts. Go ahead and close this out, and you'll see that the interface for RetopoFlow is made up of three floating panels. We have the toolbar, we have the poly count, and we also have the options. You can move those around however you'd like. The toolbar you can also collapse if you prefer, and you can also access the tools using the Q hotkey. That'll bring up a pie menu with all of the same options. We'll talk about each one of the tools in depth pretty soon, but in the toolbar, there's also a section for the documentation. If you need help with any tool, just click active tool to get the help for whichever tool you're currently using. And you can also find this same documentation online at docs.retopoflow.com. This is also where you can report a bug if you find one and where you can exit RetopoFlow. You can either exit by clicking this button, by pressing tab, or by pressing escape. The settings for that can be found in the options panel under general and startup and quit. Here we have the settings for what to check for when RetopoFlow starts and for how we want to quit. I'll go ahead and uncheck escape to quit so that when I press the escape button, it doesn't jump me out of RetopoFlow, but I can still use the tab key. All right, let's go ahead and exit RetopoFlow for now. 
and you'll see that we're now in edit mode for a new object called RetopoFlow. It doesn't have any geometry since we haven't created any yet, but the object exists. If we were to go back into object mode and start RetopoFlow again, here I just pressed tab, so we're now in object mode, and we could create a new target either at the cursor or at active like we did before. But if we do that, that's going to create a new target object rather than editing the one that we already created. To continue editing an existing target, just head into edit mode for the existing target object. For now, I'll delete the empty RetopoFlow object, and instead let's start with a plane. I'll hit Shift A, add mesh in plane, and I'll bring this to just on top of our cube here. I'll scale it down a little bit, and then to use this as the starting point for our retopology, I'll hit tab to go into edit mode and start RetopoFlow from there. I can either do that in the menu or just by using the icon to the left of the RetopoFlow menu. Now you can see that our plane has been loaded up as the low poly target object, and we're snapping to the cube, which is our high poly object. Let's go ahead and exit RetopoFlow again. I'll hit tab and confirm. And before we get too far into the details about each of the tools, let's talk for a second about poly counts. A lot of scans and sculpts are extremely high resolution. Blender has gotten a lot better at handling extremely high poly objects recently, but it's not going to be as performant as, say, ZBrush. The lower the poly count, the smoother everything is going to run, including RetopoFlow. So I always recommend decimating the high poly object before starting retopology, so that the vertex count is at least under 1 million. If it's higher than that, then RetopoFlow will give you a warning that things might slow down depending on your system. We can see an example of that with our horse statue. If we open up that file and go to RetopoFlow, it'll give us a warning that we have a high source vertex count. To fix this, I can just decimate the model. I'll go ahead and select it, head to my modifiers, and add a decimate modifier. Since we're just using this as a base for snapping, it doesn't matter whether we have good topology for this or not. It could be all triangles and it'll still work great. Now in the decimate modifier, I'll just decrease the ratio. For now, I'll set it to 0.1. Blender will think for just a second, but then instead of having 1,300,000 vertices, we have 134,000 vertices. We've brought the poly count down by a factor of 10, and we haven't lost any visible detail. We can still see all of the wrinkles, the muscles, and the tendons. We could definitely go even lower if we wanted to, but I'll go ahead and leave this here. Of course, if you go too far with the decimation, the high poly will be changed too much to get a good retopo, but realistically, I've never seen that be an issue but I have seen people working with unnecessarily high poly counts all the time. Remember, the whole goal of retopology is to create a simplified version of the mesh. As long as the change in the high poly silhouette isn't visibly noticeable when you're zoomed out, the resulting retopology will be for all intents and purposes exactly the same. There is no value in having micro detail when you're placing polygons 10 to 20 times that size. So to speed everything up, decimate it just enough so that it's exponentially fewer polygons, but the overall shape is still the same. Once that's done, go ahead and apply the modifier. You may want to do this on a copy of your mesh or in a copy of the file just to be safe. Now let's launch RetopaFlow again by creating a new target. Let's do it at the 3D cursor so that the origin is right in the middle of the world. And now we can finally talk about each of the tools so that you can get started sketching topology. Our first tool, Contours, is used for quickly wrapping loops around cylindrical forms like arms, legs, and horns. It's the one at the top in the toolbar, or you can hit Q and swipe upwards. To use it, look at your mesh at an angle you'd like to wrap the loop around hold down control, and left click and drag across the form. You'll see a yellow dashed line that indicates the angle of the loop, and then the circle indicates which part of the mesh it's going to wrap around. Let go of left click, and now you have a loop that wraps around your mesh. To change the vertex count of this loop, just hold down shift and scroll up or down. The number of vertices is reflected in this yellow number that's attached to the loop. Now with this loop still selected, I can hold down control and draw another loop to the right of it to extend that forwards. Then I can do that same thing again, and it doesn't matter whether I drag the loop up or down, to the right or to the left of the selection, or even right through the selection. Contours will always automatically extend or cut the mesh connected to the selection. But that also means that if I wanted to start on another area like this leg, and I hold down control, drag over it, make sure my circle is over that part of the mesh, then it'll try to extend that over to the leg. And that's not what I want. So I'll hit control Z to undo that. And instead I'll hit alt A to deselect everything and then start a new cut. There we go. Then I can adjust the number of vertices by shift scrolling up or down, and then continuing to make cuts from there. Again, it doesn't matter which way you drag the cut or which part of this mesh is selected. Contours works by walking around the mesh, so it even works for areas where several forms are overlapping in screen space. So for example, if we have this leg here, let's say I'm looking at it from this angle and I want to start retopoing the shin here. Well, I can just do that by holding control, left click and dragging, and just making sure that my circle is over the mesh that I want to wrap around. Once I let go, you can see that it's only wrapped around the leg in the front and not the leg in the back. 
This makes it really great for working with things like fingers that are often partially occluded. If I wanted to work on the back leg instead, even if it is partially occluded by the front leg, I could just deselect everything again to start a new cut, control, left click and drag, and just make sure that the circle is over that back leg, just like so. Now it's wrapped perfectly around that leg instead. To adjust the loops that you've already laid down, just double click a loop and then left click and drag or use the hotkey G to slide it along the mesh. Selection in Rutopa flow is currently dependent on the tool, and so in contours, since we're working with loops, we select loops. We can also use the hotkey R to rotate this loop around the mesh, or use the hotkey Shift R to do more of a shear operation. And remember that you can always cut right through the mesh and make a new loop at any time. If you want to create loops along a non-cylindrical form, Let's say we're working with this back leg here and we wanted to space it out differently so that it's not uniform spacing. What we could do is create one loop and then I'll switch over to the tweak tool, which we'll talk about more in just a second. But if we just click and drag, we can move these vertices around and I'll just make this so that it's not quite so uniform. Give us a little bit more space with these first vertices. If I go back to contours and make a second cut right across the mesh there, then it's going to try to enforce uniform spacing all the way around the loop. If I don't want that, I can go to the contours options here at the bottom of my options panel and uncheck uniform cut. With that off, contours will keep the spacing of whatever loop we're extending. By the way, if you're ever unsure what an option does, just hover over it and you'll get a helpful tooltip. With contours, you can retopo shapes like this in absolutely no time. Another way that you can insert and adjust loops is with the loops tool. Let's jump down to that one. With the loops tool, you can hold down control and insert a loop anywhere on the mesh. With that loop selected, you can left click and drag and slide it along. You can double click to select any loop. And this works even for loops that are not created by contours. Even if you have a loop that wraps all the way around the mesh in some strange way, all you need to do to adjust it is just double click and left click and drag. You'll notice that no matter where we move this, it'll still be snapped even in the areas that were occluded. So again, let's hold control, insert a new loop, and left click and drag to slide it along. You'll notice that unlike with contours, we didn't have to line up our screen to any particular orientation. While that can work great, sometimes it's just inconvenient and it's easier to insert a loop with the loops tool. Oh, one thing about loops that I almost forgot to mention is that you can insert a loop from any tool by using the hotkey control R. So just hover your mouse over the mesh, Hit Control R, you don't need to hold it down, just press it, slide the loop along, and then left click to confirm. You can also hold the loop down, so if we hit Control R, get into this mode, you can left click and hold down left click, and slide that loop, and then release to confirm. Then you'll be jumped right back to your previous tool and you can continue working. The next tool, Poly Strips, allows you to quickly sketch out strips of quads. All you need to do is hold down Control, and then left click and drag along your mesh. You can sketch any shape and the quads will follow along. If you make a nice gradual curve, then poly strips will follow that. But if you want to make a sharp angle, just like so, then poly strips will make a corner. The initial size of your quads is based on your brush size. So if we have a really big brush, then we'll make some really big quads. And if we have a really small brush, then we'll make lots of little small quads. Let's make another corner here and talk about those control points. We can use these to control the strips as if they were bezier curves. Click and drag on any control point to move it around. And then click and drag on any handle to adjust the direction and fall off. If you hold shift while adjusting the handle, it'll rotate that control point. And holding control shift will scale it. With poly strips, any set of quads can be adjusted this way. So if we deselect this, I can left click and drag to paint select all the way across and adjust this like a Bezier curve, or I can hit Alt A, deselect everything, select just this area, manipulate that, and we can do that on any part of the mesh, even something we created with any of the other tools. Similar to how we could adjust the number of points in a loop with contours, we can also adjust the number of cuts along a strip with poly strips. So if I select this strip, again by left click and dragging, we'll get a yellow number five telling us that we have five faces selected, and then I can hold shift, scroll up or down, and change that count. 
Of course, we can do this when we first create a strip, but we can also do it at any other time. We can also use poly strips to extend existing geometry. So for example, if we wanted to take this quad and extend it around the neck, we could just hold control, use a brush size that's similar enough to that quad, left click and drag, and extend it outwards. Whatever quad that we start on will be used as the starting point. Again, we can do that from any quad. Just hold control, left click and drag out from it, and there we go. But that also works for the end of a stroke. So if we start our stroke down here, and end the stroke on a quad, then it'll attach that as well. I'll go ahead and delete these examples just by holding shift, left clicking, dragging to select multiple strips, and then hitting the delete key, delete and vertices. Same thing here, I'll select that strip, delete and vertices. Poly strips is really useful early on in the retopology process to quickly place loops that define the key features. The next tool down is strokes, and while poly strips is great for sketching out geometry early on, strokes is truly OP at it and one of my main tools throughout the entire process. With the strokes tool, hold down control and click and drag to create a string of edges. Then with that loop still selected, draw a parallel stroke to extend that loop and create a patch of faces. Shift scrolling up and down will adjust the number of cuts, just like with poly strips. With strokes, you can quickly create patches by selecting some edges and then extruding them outwards, but that's only the half of it. You can also start your stroke at a vertex and draw perpendicular to that selection in order to define the side of the strip rather than the end. So for example, if I wanted to continue this down the head, I could select those three vertices by left clicking and dragging along, or I could select those edges individually by holding the shift key and then left clicking, but that's a little bit slower. Then I could either draw parallel and draw strokes that way, or I can draw perpendicular while starting at one of the corner vertices. That way I can define the side of the patch rather than the end. I can also start from this corner. Starting or stopping your stroke at a vertex is called stroke snapping, and you can change that snap distance in the stroke properties. I'll crank this up to 50 temporarily just so we can see the effect. And notice how as I hold control, I have a yellow line connecting to my vertices as they hover near them, within 50 pixels. As long as I start my stroke within that range, then it'll use that vertex as the starting point. But I can also use that as the ending point if I wanted to. I could go backwards and just make sure that I end within that range. You can also use strokes to bridge two areas. Let's say I deselect everything and create another stroke down here. I want three vertices to match up here, so I'll hold shift, scroll down one, and then I'll create a patch just by creating another parallel stroke there, shift scrolling up one, and let's say I wanted to connect these three faces with these three faces. Well, then I can just hold down control, start my stroke next to the corner of one, and end my stroke on the corner of the other. Shift scrolling up and down will still adjust the number of cuts if possible. By default, the initial number of cuts is defined by the size of the brush, just like with poly strips, when this is set to brush size but I often have it set to fixed just to make a simple extrusion. Whether you work with one or the other is really up to personal preference. But if I have it set to brush size, then you can see that that's used to define how many cuts happen when I bridge these two areas. One thing I often use strokes for is to extend from an L shape. So let's say I start with this edge and pull this outwards. Just make a couple cuts there. If I wanted to fill this entire area as a patch, all I would need to do is select these two edges drag out from this corner vertex, and draw a parallel line to the selected edges. It's automatically attached everything up for me and extended that area all the way to my stroke. Just make sure that you drag out from this corner vertex and not this one, otherwise things won't get attached. So again, select a couple edges, start your stroke on the corner that's perpendicular to the selection, and then draw a stroke that's parallel to the selection, just like that, and it'll extend it outwards for you. The last trick that Strokes has up its sleeve is that it can create circular loops as well. For example, to define the area around an eye, all we need to do is hold down control, trace that shape, and end right where we started. Just make sure you don't have anything else selected like this edge over here, otherwise it'll get confused and won't know what to do. So just deselect everything, make a new stroke, outline the eyeball, and there we have it. Again, we can hold shift, scroll up to add a couple vertices, 
And then if we wanted to extend this outwards, is just hold down control and make another stroke. But you can see my stroke snapping is getting in the way and that might confuse us. So I'll set that back down to 10, just so it doesn't try to snap to the stroke there. But then with this loop selected, I can hold down control, draw along the eyelid here, and right where I started, and now I have a perfect loop of faces. Strokes is amazing for defining initial loops and for filling in areas after those loops have been created. After strokes is patches, which can be used to fill an area with quads. To use it as a bridge, just select two edge loops of equal edge count. So here I have three edges. I'll left click and drag to paint select those three. Then I'll hold shift and paint select these three up here. Immediately, this area will get filled in by a green dashed line preview that shows what the patch is going to look like. But it's not real geometry yet, so if you switch back to another tool, that'll go away. And it only appears when you're in the patches tool. To actually make this real geometry, you can either hit enter or the familiar hotkey for filling F. I'll hit Control Z on that though, so I can show you that just like with the other tools, you can also hold Shift and scroll up or down to increase or decrease the amount of cuts. I'll make one cut there, and then again I'll hit F to fill. Patches can also fill L shapes just like strokes can. So let's make one of those. I'll go ahead and select my Poly Strips tool, increase my brush size, and I'll extend from this top quad down along the mesh. Now if I wanted to fill this area here, all I would need to do is select my Patches tool, Double click on the top edge loop to select it. Shift double click on the side edge loop to select that one as well. And then when the preview is generated, hit F to fill in that patch. Patches can also fill in C shapes. So if I go back to my poly strips tool again, and this time extend the quad on the right all the way back down, I'll make sure it has an equal number of vertices as the one on the left. Just like so. And then we can select our patches tool. Shift double click, to select all these edge loops and then again hit F to fill. But I don't often use patches all that much because we could do both of those things with the strokes tool. So for example, if we have a C-shaped selection, instead of selecting all of the edge loops that go all the way around and using the patches tool, I can just select this one edge right at the top, hold control again with the strokes tool, left click and drag to draw a stroke from one end vertex to the other, and fill it in like that. If you end up getting this cross error, which happens every once in a while, go ahead and draw a stroke in the opposite direction. The one thing the patches tool can do that the strokes tool cannot do is fill in fully enclosed areas. So for example, if I take all of these faces here and just delete and faces, this is not something that we can fill in with strokes. However, with patches, we just need to select everything going around that outside and hit F to fill. It only works in simple cases, so it doesn't create things like quad junctions, but that type of enhancement has been on our list for a while and something that we'll look at adding in the future. The other advantage that Patches has over Strokes is that it works in world space rather than in screen space. So for example, if I undo all of these edits here, and let's make an L-shaped selection, I'll go back to Strokes, and let's say I want to extend these two edges all the way down here. Well, this works great if I'm looking at it dead on, but if I'm looking at it from an awkward angle, say something like this, and I try to do that same thing then that's not going to work very well. We'll get a bit of a mess because it was trying to interpolate it according to the view. However, if we do that same thing with patches, then that'll be no problem no matter where our view is positioned. So let's go to the patches tool, shift double click to select the side edge loop as well. And I can look at this from any angle, whether it's occluded or not, just like so, hit F, and that patch gets filled in just fine. The other important thing to know about when working with patches is how to mark something as a corner. So for example, let's say we have an area that's not clearly rectangular. I'll go ahead and go back to my poly strips tool just to select all these faces here. Delete and faces. And if we go to our patches tool, we can see that it can easily fill it in and detect where the corners are. These yellow dots are indicating the corners. But if we don't like where they're automatically generated, we can move them around if we want to. We can do that by holding control and shift clicking on a vertex. So if I hold control and shift and click on that corner, it removes it as a corner. And if I hold control and shift on another vertex, it'll add that as a corner. Now you can see that I'm getting an error if I move the corner over there because there's no way that this can be filled with just quads. So it'll give us a bad rectangle count. Now where this might be useful is if this area wasn't obviously rectangular. I'll go ahead and take my tweak tool, which again, we'll look at more closely in another video, but I'll just left click and drag and drag these vertices so that it's a little bit more rounded 
just like that. So it's not quite as obvious where the corners should be. And then I'll go back to the patches tool and you can see that it has no longer detected the corners. In fact, it thinks this top vertex is the corner when that's not what I want. So instead, I'll hold control shift and left click that vertex to remove it as a corner and then manually place my corners just like that. And then again, hit F to fill. Again, I don't use patches all that often because a lot of the functionality can be found in the strokes tool and also in the poly pen tool, which we'll talk about next, but it can definitely come in handy when you need to bridge some edge loops or do a grid fill. Polypen is the other tool that I use the most frequently. With it, you can precisely place individual tries and quads. If you want to extend from a selection, you can just select a vertex or an edge, hold down control, left click to place a point. That's going to create a triangle, but then with that triangle still selected, you can hold down control again, left click to place another point, and that'll turn it into a quad. Let's try that again. Hold down control, left click to place a vertex, make that a triangle, and left click again to place a quad. If you create a point close to another point, it'll automatically snap them together. So for example, if I want to extend this edge downwards, I can just hold down control, place a point here, and then snap the next point to the existing vertex. Similar story here, I can just select this edge here, left click to create one point, and then left click on the existing vertex to use that to finish the quad. Polypen can also be used to create geometry from scratch. We can left click or use Alt A to deselect everything, hold down control, and here we can place a new vertex anywhere. If we continue holding control and left click again, that'll create an edge, continue holding control, left click again to create a triangle, and again once more to make a quad. Now to bridge these two quads, all I need to do is have one edge selected and then hover over the other. I could also snap this to a vertex, just like so, but I'll hover over the edge and left click to confirm. That will bridge the two and then it'll automatically select this edge up here so that I can continue drawing quads if I wanted to. By default, Polypen is in this try quad mode where you first create a triangle and then you create a quad. This is useful because it allows you to define the points of your quad as precisely as possible. For example, if we wanted to take this edge down here and redirect it over to the right, all I'd need to do is just hold down control, create a quad like that, that's a little bit slanted, and continue that along. But if we don't need that much precision and we want to go a little bit faster, we can use quad only mode. To do that, head over to the polypen options and choose quad only. We can also get to this with the shift Q hotkey to bring up the pie menu. So the Q hotkey brings up our tool menu but then shift Q brings up the tool options. With quad only, we can just select an edge, hold down control and left click to make a quad. If the edge of the quad is close enough to another vertex, it'll snap right to it. This makes it really easy to draw out your topology. We can also set this to triangle only mode if we want to create triangles that don't turn into quads or we could use edge only, but these two I don't use that often. So I'll set it back to try quad. Polypen can also be used to move individual vertices, edges, and faces around. To do that, just select a component and then left click and drag over it to tweak. We can do that with edges, vertices, or faces. Just like with the other tools, we can also left click and drag to select the shortest path to select a whole set of edges or a whole set of faces. You can also left click an empty space to deselect everything. Now, when you move one vertex on top of another in Polypen, they'll be automatically merged. So if I take this vertex, left click to select it, left click and drag again to tweak it and bring it on top of this other vertex. Now these have become one and they're merged. Again, left click, click and drag and bring that on top of another vertex. If you don't want that behavior, then you can disable auto merge in the preferences. And now when you bring one vertex close to another, they're not going to be merged but I generally find it helpful, so I leave that on most of the time. With Polypen, any selected triangle can become a quad. Now, the last trick that Polypen has is that it can also be used as a simple knife. I wouldn't use it for complex cases, but if you just want to cut through some faces, you can select an edge or a face as a starting point, hold down control until you get the knife icon, left click to start the cut, click on an edge opposite that face, and continue doing that all the way down. Just like that, I've added a new edge loop. If you want to do longer or more complex cuts, then I'd recommend switching to the knife tool instead. That one's next on the list, and to use it, you can just hold down control, left click anywhere, even outside the mesh. That'll start the cut. And then I can left click anywhere, even inside the face, continue holding down control, and just keep left clicking until you have the shape that you want. 
So with the knife tool, we can make end gons and we can slice through anything. I'll just finish this section up by creating a junction. I'll select this vertex here, hold down control, and connect it to this vertex opposite of it. And now we've changed the direction of this loop. Again, to create a cut with a knife tool, you can either start with something selected and try to attach it to that, or deselect everything, start outside the mesh, and just cut all the way through. If you have something selected, you can also use the hotkey E to start a new cut, just like in Blender's knife tool. So polypen, as well as knife, are great for working out complex topology when you need precise control. The tweak tool, which we looked at briefly before, is great for pushing vertices around. It acts like a brush, so when you select the tool you'll see an orange circle around your cursor, and anything inside that circle is going to be moved when you click and drag. Just like any other brush in Blender, you can hit F to change the size, Shift F to change the strength, and Control F to change the falloff. In case you forget, this is also listed down at the status bar. You can also change the settings for the tweak tool in the options. Just go to tweak, and here we can choose what to include or exclude. For example, we can include the boundaries, exclude them, or we can also use this helpful option called slide which keeps the boundary in the same place, but slides the vertices along it. I don't often use this when it comes to the tweak tool, but I use it all the time when it comes to the relax tool, which we'll look at next. We can also do that same thing along the line of symmetry and choose whether or not we want to move occluded or selected vertices. Underneath that, we have the brush options where we can change the size, strength, and fall off like we looked at before. I usually just use the hotkey though, because that's a lot faster. If you're wondering what the falloff is, it's how close a vertex needs to be to the center of the circle in order to get affected 100%. If I have it set to 1, then anything in the very center of the circle will be moved at whatever we have our strength set to. But the farther away it gets from that middle of the circle, the less it's going to be affected. This makes it very easy to use as a brush. It's also helpful to switch between different presets of these brushes. For example, a lot of the time I just want to use the tweak tool to move one vertex at a time. And if that's the case, I'll make a preset just for that. In this case, I've called it tiny, and I set the strength to 15, the strength to one, and the fall off to one. To access a preset, we can either click preset to current, or we can hit shift Q to bring up our tool pie menu, and I'll swipe up to select that first preset. Now I've got a little tiny tweak tool where I can move each vertex individually. But sometimes I want to move whole groups of vertices, and for that, I want a larger preset. So I have one for that as well. I'll hold shift Q and swipe over to the right to access it. In this way, I can very quickly change between different setups. Now, one of the best things about tweak is that it can be accessed from any other tool using the hotkey C. So let's say we're in the strokes tool and we're just making some strokes, adding some geometry, and that vertex isn't quite where I want it. Well, to access the tweak tool temporarily, I can just hold down the C key. That'll switch over to strokes while I'm still holding down C. I can move my vertices around, and then I can let go of C, get back to my strokes tool, and continue drawing. In this way, I can very easily add geometry, adjust it, and get back to adding geometry. The relax tool works in very much the same way, but instead of moving vertices around, it tries to evenly space and smooth them out. So if I have a bunch of geometry that's pretty congested, let's say we take our tweak tool and really mess it up here, we can do whatever, whatever we want, we can make it look pretty bad. But then if we take our relax tool, left click and drag, it'll smooth everything out. Now it does this in a pretty smart way using a variety of factors. We can find what it's taking into account if we go to the relax options and down to algorithm options. I don't often have to change these, but if you're a power user and you find some edge case where it's not doing exactly what you want, then you might want to check these out. Here we can choose whether it takes the average edge length into account, whether it tries to straighten the edges, whether it takes the face radius into account, the average face edge length, or the face angles. We can also turn on correct flip faces if we want it to recalculate the normals of anything that we brush over. The relax tool is one where I often like to have the boundary set to slide. Because if I have this set to include, then often it'll push or pull vertices too far away from where I want that silhouette to be. For example, like this. If I have this set to slide instead, then it'll just slide along the edge and hold that silhouette. The hotkey for the relax tool is Z. So if we're in another tool like polypen and we're adjusting some vertices, we can go ahead and smooth them by holding down Z, clicking and dragging, and then letting go of Z. 
The relax tool is truly amazing to have during retopology and you'll see me using it a lot in my workflow example later. Next, let's look at how to work with symmetry in RetopoFlow. To enable it, we just need to go to our options and down to symmetry. Then we can enable it for the X, Y, and or Z axis. For now, I'll enable it along the X. By default, the visualization should be set to plane and that'll show you the axis of symmetry. You'll notice that our model here isn't exactly symmetrical, so it's not gonna quite work by default. We can also turn on edge visualization in case we don't wanna see that plane in the way. That'll build an edge that runs all the way around the model. Or we could also turn on face visualization. This one can be helpful because it tells you which side you can draw on and which side is the side that's mirrored. This is really important because one of the questions that I get the most is why vertices are snapping to the center line. So for example, if we draw on one side, of course it's mirrored over to the other side, but if we were to draw on the red side of the mesh or the negative side of the axis, all of those points are gonna snap right to the center line. So it's important to have that symmetry set up correctly so that you can draw on whichever side of the mesh that you want. Now the axis of symmetry is not based on the world, it's actually based on the retopology target object. So we can rotate this object into place so that we can work on both sides of her face at the same time, even though she's not facing forwards. So let's go ahead and exit Retopa flow for now. That'll leave us in edit mode in our target retopology object, which at the moment doesn't have any geometry. So let me add a plane just to make this easier to line up. I'll hit shift A, add a new plane. And I'll rotate this 90 degrees. I'll move this up along the Z axis. And you can see that if we have symmetry enabled in Rotobo flow, that'll add a mirror modifier for us. For now, I'll just ignore that though. And what I want to do is go into object mode, switch my transform orientation to local, and that way when I rotate my object, that's gonna follow along. Let me switch over to my move tool so that we can see that. As I rotate this, then our X axis is gonna be rotated. So what I wanna do is just line this local orientation up with my object. And I might have to move it over a little bit, rotate it slightly, but I'll try to get that as dead on as possible. If I'm not exact, that's okay. We can always fix that later. If I want to look at this object dead on, I can just hit shift one, and line it up from there as well. That's gonna look at the local front view. Now it's not going to be exact because this object isn't completely symmetrical, but it's gonna be close enough for us. So I'll hit tab to go into edit mode here. I'll go ahead and delete all of the vertices of my plane and just start Rotopo flow from edit mode. Remember that that uses the current object that's in edit mode as the retopology object. And so the retopology object is going to have the correct orientation. Once inside Rotopo flow, we can go to symmetry and see that our symmetry is working perfectly. I can draw on one side of the face and it'll be mirrored over to the other side. Now, if you find your vertices snapping to the center line because they're too close, then we just need to reduce this threshold in the symmetry settings. Right now it's 0 0.001, but I'll add another zero in there just to be safe. All right, now it won't snap. You'll notice that as I start working here, the further I get from this symmetry line, things might start to hover a little bit on the other side of the mesh. For example, if I take my strokes tool and maybe make a stroke under the eye, I'll just make some example topology here. You'll see that it's not lining up exactly with the mesh on the other side. And that's okay if it's not exact because since this model isn't symmetrical, we'll need to do some manual pushing and pulling anyway at the end. For now, we just need to get close enough. So maybe we could rotate our axis of symmetry a little bit such that this is out more towards the cheek. But once we're done, then we can go ahead and apply the symmetry. Let's say that we finished the entire face this way. Then let's go ahead and click apply mirror. That's gonna do two things. First, it'll apply that mirror modifier such that this becomes real geometry on the other side that we can now edit, but it'll also snap it to the surface. Now, if we realize later on that we made a mistake and we actually do want symmetry, then we can go ahead and turn symmetry on again, just like so, and then go to target cleaning, unselect everything, and choose select bad symmetry. Now, I don't think there's any reason we need to call this bad symmetry. It's just symmetry that happens to be on the wrong side of the axis. So we can go ahead and hit delete and delete those vertices. Just like that, we can continue working. One of the things that's unique about Rotopa flow is how it draws the low poly mesh over the high poly sculpt. What's nice about this is we get a nice clean display on the front side of the mesh, but everything that's behind the sculpt is being blocked. But depending on your model, you might want to adjust the default settings to display a little bit better. For example, over here on his front left leg, it's kind of poking through his front right leg a little bit. 
and we can change the settings to easily fix that. Anything related to the display of Rotopa flow is in the viewport display section in the options. There are a lot of settings in here, but I usually only touch a couple. The first is hide overlays. If you uncheck this, then you'll see all of Blender's overlays like the grid and any non-mesh objects. Here, you might notice that our horse is scaled up a little bit. This is because Rotopa Flow scales everything up or down to a constant size. This helps the tools and the visualization be a lot more consistent. And once you exit Rotopa Flow, everything's scaled back, so you should never notice this, unless of course you uncheck Hide Overlays. But sometimes this is useful to turn off if you need to see your grease pencil strokes or something like that. Another setting you might want to change is Optimized Shading. This can either be set to Light or Dark. Both of these options will set a matte cap for the sculpt object, as well as optimize the other shading settings for performance. For example, turning off shadows, turning on back face culling, and things like that. If you don't want that to be the case, and you just want to use whatever your viewport settings are, then go ahead and turn this off. I find the dark mode works pretty well with the high contrast between the high poly and the low poly, so I often like to leave it at that. Below that we have our selection theme. In case you don't like green, you can also change it to blue or orange. Now skipping down a little bit, we have view clipping, which is extremely important when it comes to the low poly visualization. Rotopa Flow is automatically adjusting the view clipping as you zoom in and out, which helps this visualization to be a little bit more stable. You can see it doesn't quite look as good if we turn that off. So I'd recommend leaving that on, but then also changing some of these values depending on your model. The defaults again usually work fine, but here's how I set it if you want to customize it. You can think about view clipping as the minimum distance that you can see and the maximum distance that you can see. So if you zoom in at some point, things are going to start to disappear. And if you zoom out far enough, again, things are going to disappear. And those extremes are your start minimum and your end maximum. Now, beginners, when they start learning about view clipping, might be tempted to just make them extreme, make the minimum really, really low and the maximum really, really high, just so that they can see as much as possible. But the farther apart that those two values are from each other, the less stable that the visualization is going to be. And that's true of all view clipping in any program. So the way that I recommend setting it is just zooming in to about as close as you'd ever want to work. I don't think I'd want to zoom in any farther than this. Then I'll bump up the start minimum until the geometry starts poking through a little bit. I'll set it to 0 0.005 and that's poking through a little too much. So let's try 0 0.003. That seems to be pretty good. And then when I zoom out a little bit at a normal working distance, this is looking great. Then to set the maximum, I'll find something that's poking through the mesh that really shouldn't be. For example, here we have the leg poking through the other leg or the leg poking through his back. This is the one that I'll focus on here. I just need to bump up the end maximum until that's no longer happening. I'll try 200 and that helps for the most part, but it's right on the edge. So I'll bump that up to 300 and that seems to fix it. We can also see that it's no longer poking through his other leg. And now the visualization is working great. It's important to know that all of these settings are saved across Rotopa Flow sessions. So if you open up a different blend file and start working in that, all of these settings like your shading settings and your selection theme are going to be saved automatically. Underneath the view clipping, we have a couple more options for drawing the low poly mesh. There's a non-manifold outline, which just outlines the edges that aren't connected to anything else. And there are similar visualizations for pinned and masked geometry and for seams. There's also a normal offset, which bumps the low poly mesh above the sculpt. So if we set that to something a little higher, I think the maximum is two, then that's just going to push everything out and make it a little easier to see. If this is set to zero, then things might intersect with the sculpt a little bit too much. So the default of 0.01 usually works great. You can also change the alpha value of what's above the sculpt object or what's visualized below the sculpt object. You can either set that to zero or if you want it to display the same, you can set it to one. I usually leave that at 0.1 as a pretty nice effect. Here you can also change the vertex size, the edge size, and if you really want to get granular, then you can go into the individual alpha values and change the alpha for every single thing that we're drawing. For the most part though, I leave those at their defaults. One thing that is important to know is that while Rotopa Flow does scale everything to the same size as it enters Rotopa Flow, it doesn't mess with the scene scale. And so if you do have a changed scene scale, it might affect the visualization in some weird ways. So we've tried to account for this the best we can, but there's just some things that we can't quite work around. So if we exit Rotopa Flow really quick and go to our scene settings, let's say that we set our unit scale to 0.1 and then enter Rotopa Flow again. As we do that, everything's going to be visualized as if it's a little too close to the mesh. 
Similarly, if we set the unit scale to something too large, then everything's going to appear too far away from the sculpt mesh. So in general, as we're working with Rotova flow, I'd really recommend leaving your unit scale at one. That's just going to make everything work a little bit more consistently. Now, visualization and selection in Blender are pretty tied together. Usually in Blender, if you can see something, you can select it. That's not quite true of Rotova flow. Here you can see I have a faint visualization of the points under his leg, but I can't select them. The reason we want this on is that if you have a vertex that's slightly under the mesh for some reason, you'll still want to be able to see it. And sometimes you'll also want to be able to select it. So for that, go to the selection settings and just turn off block occluded. Now I can select anything regardless of whether the sculpt is in front or not. Similarly, we can also turn off block back face. If that's off, then I'll be able to select the back face of anything. But usually, I like to leave those on. That way we're not accidentally messing with anything that's on the other side of our mesh without us knowing about it. There's also an option here to select everything that's linked to the selection. Now, this is particularly helpful when it comes to hiding things. Now, because this visualization is custom and we're drawing new vertices on top of Blender, it is currently one of the performance bottlenecks of Rotoba Flow. So this is something that we are actively investigating and working on improving. But in the meantime, if your low poly object is getting up there in poly count and things are starting to slow down, what you can do is hide the sections that you're not currently working on. So to do that really quickly, I'll just select some section, hit Control L or use that select linked option in the options, and then just hit H to hide. You can also do that in the target visibility panel. Here we can hide what's selected, unselected, visible, or not visible. I'll just hover my mouse over some of these sections, hit L to add them to my selection, and then hide selected. At any point, we can also use Alt-H to unhide them or use the reveal hidden button. So again, if you find that your performance is degrading, what I would recommend doing, number one, is hiding the sections that you're not currently working on. And if that's not quite enough, then what you could also do is exit Rotopa flow, hit P, separate by selection, hide that mesh for the time being, whatever you're not currently working on, and then enter Rotopa flow again. I definitely realize that needing to hide things for performance is not convenient, and so it's going to be a big thing to address in future versions of Rotopa flow. But for now, that's the workaround if you happen to run into that issue. Lastly, we talked about the visualization of pinning and seams, but we didn't talk about how to actually work with those. That would be under the pinning and seams panel, which is pretty self-explanatory, but here you can pin vertices or set edges as seams. For example, if I select just some of these faces here and I want to make sure that I don't move them, I can hit pin selected. Now, no matter what tool I'm using, I'm not going to be able to move those. To clear that, I can just hit unpin all. We can also mark seams. So if you happen to want to start your UV process while you're in Rotopa flow and already have some seams selected, you can just select an edge and mark seam. That'll display it as a slightly different color and if you'd like, you can set this to pin and the seams won't be moved. This is mostly useful for setting loops along the edges of hard surfaces where you already know that you want to make a cut later and you don't want those vertices to shift. These were all features that users asked for at some point that we included in Rotopa Flow, and we hope you find them useful as well. For the workflow demo to show how all of these tools work together, I'm going to be retopologizing the face of the Viking sculpt from Kentramel's character building workshop. If you'd like to follow along, you can find this file in the downloads below the video on cgcookie.com. Before starting Rotopa Flow, there are always a couple things that we need to check. Number one is poly count, which right now is below 100,000, so it's well within our range. Even if it were up to a million, 1.5 million, I think we'd be okay. The second thing to look for is that symmetry is going to be where we want it. If I zoom out, we can see that the 3D cursor is at the center of the scene, right in the middle of him. That's also where the object origin is, so whether I start at, at cursor or at active won't matter in this case. But if he was rotated a little bit, then I'd want to do at active. Or if the 3D cursor was somewhere else in the world, then I'd want to go ahead and center that back before starting. So I'll just hit Shift S, cursor to world origin, and then I'll go ahead and go to Rotobo Flow and create a new target at cursor. Now, if I were going to retopologize this entire character, I would start with contours. I'd make a couple cuts across his chest, and maybe work on the arms. However, in this demo, I'm just going to be working on the face, so I'll leave that for another time. But contours is generally the one that I would start with. For the face, however, there's not really a loop that goes all the way around, except maybe his head, but we can easily save that for later. What I'll start with now is poly strips. So I'll select the poly strips tool, hit F to choose a medium brush size, 
and then I'll trace along his jaw. The first thing we need to do is just define the major loops, and this is one of the big ones. All right, there we go. I don't know exactly how many vertices we're going to need here, so I'll keep it nice and sparse. We can always add detail later. I'll bring this down along his jaw, and if, as I'm moving these, the vertices jump over onto his neck, I can easily hold down C, take my tweak tool, and bring those back. I'm not going to worry too much about lining everything up exactly, because we can always clean it up with the tweak and relax tools later. I just want to get some strip down. With that one down, I'll bring this in towards the middle, but first I'll turn on symmetry. So I'll go to symmetry in the options, and turn it on for the x-axis. Then I'll hold down control, left click and drag, towards the middle. I'll hold down shift, scroll down, just to get one less cut, and I'll bring this down towards the bottom of his chin. There we go, and then I'll continue using the tweak tool just to massage these into place. Again, I don't know exactly how many vertices we need just yet, so I'll keep it nice and sparse. With this loop done, let's go ahead and add a loop around his eyes. For this, I'll use the strokes tool. Since the poly strips tool, if we were to go all the way around, it won't complete a full circle. I think that's something that could be possible for us to add in the future, but for now it doesn't connect at the end. So let's go to our strokes tool and just draw a stroke around the eyes. I'll go up and above that fold, down below the eyelid, and back up. With things like the eyes and the mouth, it's good to have the same number of vertices at the top and at the bottom. So in this case, I want to choose an even number. 20 is just the right density for the level of detail that I want here. So again, I'll just hold down C and massage these into place. To make a face loop, I just need to keep these vertices selected and paint another loop around it. I'll go up to the brow line, down towards the cheekbone, and back up. Some of these didn't get placed exactly where I want, so again, I can just hold down C and move these around. Now this brush is a little bit too big, so let me go to my tweak tool, hold F to make a smaller brush, and I'll hit Shift F and bring that in towards the center to make it a little bit stronger. Now I can move one vertex at a time. All right, I won't spend too much time tweaking here because that's not particularly interesting to watch. And we can also always fix things with the relax tool later on. But I will space these out a little bit better, just like so. And then I'll bring this up and over to the bridge of the nose. So I'll take the three edges that are closest and just extrude those outwards. And for that, I'll use the strokes tool. So I'll switch back to that. I'll grab those three edges and draw a stroke right down the middle. I often overshoot a little bit just so it snaps to the middle. But if your vertices didn't quite make it to the middle, again, just hold down C, bring up the tweak tool and move those around. If we need another cut, then we can easily add that in with Control R. Control R, let go, left click, and there we have it. Now we can add the loop that goes all the way around this entire area. I'll do that in two halves just because I don't want to make the entire stroke all at once. So I'll shift, left click, and drag to select all of those edges. Again, hold down Control, and draw up and around. Then I'll select this entire bottom area, left click and drag, hold down Control, Start at the top vertex and extend that all the way down and up and over the bridge of his nose. For the areas where I didn't draw my stroke quite perfectly, then I can just go in again holding C and work with my tweak tool. I can already tell that I'm going to want to add some more edge loops in here, so I'm not going to worry too much if these vertices are a little bit stretched. I do know, however, that I want a pull right in the middle of his cheekbone here. So I'm going to follow the contours of that cheekbone and bring the rest of these vertices up a little bit. And then this area is looking a little bit stretched and we'll definitely want more geometry to support the animation of his eyes opening and closing. So I can easily add another edge loop there with control R. All right, before we get too detailed though, let's add another loop that goes from the bridge of his nose all the way down and around his chin. For that, I can also use the strokes tool. The geometry here is a little bit too sparse though. So I'll make sure that we have vertices at all of the major extreme points on the edges of his chin. And let's add in one more edge loop right in here. Control R, left click, and then use C to massage that into place. So now I want a loop that goes up and around starting here. So I'll use this edge as a starting point. I'll first take these first four edges, hold down control, and just draw a stroke above them. 
Then I can use C, change these vertices so that they're pointing a little bit upwards. And now I'll use poly strips to draw a strip of quads all the way up towards his nose. I'll hold Q to open up the pie menu. Swipe to the upper right for poly strips. Make sure my brush size is reasonably close to this quad here. Hold down control and left click and drag up and over. It's getting a little bit cramped in there so I won't go all the way up. And I'll hold down shift until I have, let's say about six. Again, I don't know exactly how many vertices I'm going to need, but I do know that I want it to line up pretty well over here by the cheek. All right, so I'll line up this area and then I can go ahead and connect it. Even with poly strips still enabled, I can just left click and drag over. That'll create a little bit of a bridge. And then I can use the strokes tool to extend this up and across his nose. So I'll hit Q, go to the right to activate the strokes tool and then I'll left click and drag to select all of these top vertices. And then to extend them downwards, I'll hold down control, start at this bottom right vertex, and just draw a patch just like so. All right, now we almost have all of the major loops completed, but I still want one that goes all the way around his mouth. So let's do that next. With the strokes tool still enabled, I'll just trace his mouth like so, just the upper portion of his lips, down to the bottom of the bottom lip, and I'll just draw across the crease of the lips. Then again, I'll use the tweak tool, hold down C, and I'll try to bunch these vertices up a little bit more towards the bottom here. And maybe we'll need a few more. It looks like we need one more vertex right in here, but we can add that very easily once we add some faces here. So to extrude this outwards, I'll again, with this loop still selected, hold down control and draw a stroke all the way around his mouth. All right, then I'll tweak this into place. I'll try to follow the contours of the edges of his mouth. All right, that's working pretty well, but we definitely need another loop here. So I'll hit Control R, add that in. And then I might want to add another edge loop to this bottom here in order to make that match the top, but I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. For now, let's just make the obvious connections. I do know that I don't want too many loops running down here towards the bottom, so I'll try not to make this too dense. First, I'll go ahead and just connect these areas here. I can select both of them, hold down control, and connect them with the strokes tool. I'll use two cuts, just like so. That seems to work out pretty well. And then let's space these edges around the mouth out a little bit better. I definitely want more edges towards the end of his mouth. I'll bring these out, just like so. And then with these vertices down here, we can also move them in towards the center a little bit. If I want to do this quickly and I have a lot of loops to move, then I can move to the loops tool, double click, and just slide this along. Might still switch to my strokes tool temporarily, but very quickly I can get this worked out. All right, I think that works pretty well. You will need to move these out just a little bit, out and down. I'll obviously need to add in few more cuts here, but not just yet. Let's see how everything connects so far. I'll go back to my strokes tool, select these three edges, and then I can count one, two, three edges, one, two, three edges on the bottom and connect those two vertices. There we go, that seems to work. Then I'll do the same thing here. I'll bring this edge down, connect that as well and this one, and this one. And I'm not exactly sure how I want to line everything up here just yet, but I do know that I want this bottom one to continue on and around the mouth. So I'll left click and drag, select that bottom area, and then hold down control, left click and drag, and just extrude that upwards around his mouth. I'll hold down C, tweak that a little bit, even out the spacing. And before we get too much farther, let's go ahead and smooth this out a little bit with the relax tool. I'll switch over to that and just left click and drag. Now we might need to use our tweak tool to actually space things out a little bit more. And if your relax tool isn't working exactly how you'd like, you can go down to relax and algorithm options and mess with these settings. I found that if I use straighten edges and average edge length, then sometimes things get a little bit too wiggly. 
Now, Wiggly isn't necessarily bad and it is straightening it out, but it is kind of distracting and not all that helpful in this case. So at the moment, I just have average edge length and face radius enabled. So those are the only two things that it's taking into account. And that gives us a nice gentle blend. But I will space these out a little bit more. In this case, since I'm working with a lot of vertices, I might want to go to my tweak tool and use one of the larger brushes. So in this case, I'll just hold Shift Q, swipe right to get my large preset, zoom out a little bit, and move all of these vertices together. I'll just give them a little bit more room. I'll just give them a little bit more room around the mouth so those vertices aren't quite so bunched together. And again, I can do this with really broad strokes because once I'm done moving a group of vertices, it might not look super pretty, but then I can again switch to the Relax tool and even that out very quickly. Before completing the cheek, I'll bounce up and work on the nose. The most obvious place to start is right down the bridge. So I'll start with the strokes tool. And let's just take a couple of these edges here. Maybe even just this first middle one and draw it all the way down towards the base. Hold down shift, scroll up a couple times just to give that a couple cuts. And it's places like this where I really appreciate that we just don't even have to think about snapping at all. It just happens automatically. Now that I'm getting down to this really tiny area, I'll switch over to the poly pen. I'll hold down control and make a quad that tapers at this end. Becomes quite small. And let's see, it looks like it's snapping right towards the center line a little bit too early. So let's go to our symmetry options. And let's just turn down this threshold, but 0.5. And that might even just default it to zero because that's so, so, so small. But if I do that, then we don't have to worry about those vertices snapping towards the center. Now I can hold down control, left click on this edge down here and connect that up. All right, now we'll probably want one more cut up in here towards the nostrils. So with this face selected, again, still with poly pen, I can use it as a knife tool just by left clicking and cutting across the face. Now, PolyPen has limited knife tool functionality, but it does work great for cases like that. Then I'll switch over to my strokes tool and I'll make a circle around the nostrils. I'll draw a stroke all the way around like this. And I'll scroll down until we have about 10 vertices. That looks like things should line up quite well. I'll tweak that by holding down C. And then with that edge loop still selected, draw another stroke around it to close it up as a face loop. All right, this should line up really well. I'll pull these out a little bit. And I might actually go ahead and move these vertices and snap them over to the center line instead of having this tiny strip of quads go right through the middle, just to keep things even more simple. So I'll take poly pen, select these vertices, and move the vertices right on top of each other. That will go ahead and merge them as long as in target cleaning, we have that merge by distance set to something small. All right, I'll drop those on top of each other. We can add another edge loop around here if we need more detail, but I think this will be plenty. Then I'll go ahead and connect these vertices up down towards the mouth. I can just select one edge, hold down control and left click on that other edge. Let's do that for this one as well. I'll bring this vertex up, maybe bring this one out a little bit more, select one edge, hold down control and select the other edge. All right, now I want to outline this side of the nose, the little bulbous part, and PolyPen is great for that as well. I'll select this edge and just start drawing a loop that goes all the way around. I'll sort of angle it so that it comes back around and connect it up like so. Then I'll hold down C and move the vertices into place. And for precision work like this, this brush is way too big. So I'll go back to the tweak tool, shift Q, get my tiny preset. If you don't have that preset, again, you can go to the tweak tool and down to brush options and change your presets here. And I'll use this to line up our vertices a little bit more.
All right, I think I can merge these vertices as well. So I'll go back to Polypen and just pull them up and pull that back down. All right, then I can use my tweak tool, pull these guys down just like so. All right, I'm realizing now that I need more vertices in this area. So I'm gonna shift these vertices over a little bit to the left. In this case, I'll use my large preset and push things over this way a little bit. And I'll need to disconnect these faces here. So I can go to Polypen, select those faces and delete faces. All right, that'll give me a little bit more to work with here. And I'll connect this area back up with Polypen. I also want to shift these vertices up a little bit before it goes in, connects with the nose. So what I need to do is go ahead and delete these faces, then shift these over a bit. There we go, that gives them a little bit more breathing room. Just like so. All right, then I can build these faces back in and I already know I want to connect them, so I can do that just like that. And I'll bring this one down and connect it up. All right, I'll make sure that vertex is right in the crease, just like so. Now this loop that goes down and around and meets his jaw, I'd like to follow this line a little bit better of the folds of his cheek. So I'll move this into place as well, just like so, and then we can fill in this area. I'll use my poly pen tool again, fill in two more quads towards the right, connect this quad up here along that fold, and fill in two more quads going up towards his nostril. Things are looking a little bit pinched, but we can easily take our tweak tool and massage things out. All right, then we can get some practice in with the patches tool by going over to patches, double clicking both of these edge loops. And to really use this, we need to decide where our corners should be. I'll use control shift left click to toggle corners And let's just create a patch such that the center line runs all the way down from the top towards the bottom. So we place the two corners on opposite sides of that. Then I'll hit F or enter to confirm. For this area here, I don't know if it'll make a nice patch right away. We can try, but we don't have an even number of vertices. And that's okay because I'd like this loop to come up and around anyway. So I'll take the poly pen tool and just trace a line going down here. then redirect this loop out towards this side of his nose. All right, now we have a good shape that supports that, and we can easily connect this up over to the left. It looks like we might need a couple more cuts, so let's go ahead and move these vertices up, line them up. I'll move this one down, and just add in another loop with Control R. Left click, and there we go. Now we can take the patches tool again, Make sure we have all of these edges selected. Choose these four corners if you need to, and then hit F to confirm. All right, that's pretty decent for the nose topology, but things are looking a little bit rough, so I'll take the Relax tool, maybe ease up on the strength just a little bit with Shift F, and just run over this to even things out a bit more. I just wanna make sure not to do that too much over by the major creases, because I need those vertices to be exactly in that crease. But everything in between is a great thing to smooth out. All right, just to complete the nose, what I'll do is take my strokes tool, double click to go around, and then just draw one more stroke on the inside of his nose. And we can easily extrude this back and upwards in edit mode later if we need to. And there we go. Maybe pull the rest of these vertices out just a little bit, just so they sit right on that ridge and define the shape. Now let's go ahead and work out the cheek topology. I said before that I do want to pull right down here towards his cheekbone. So let's go ahead and connect this up as a quad. And then to make a pole, we just need to split off this quad in a different direction. So 
we'll smooth this out just a little bit again with the tweak tool and then use poly pen to go down along this jaw muscle. I'll give us a little bit more room to work here. There we go. Follow that cheekbone a little bit better. Even this out. And then I'll start connecting things up here towards the top. We can see that this already lines up quite well. So I'll massage the vertices into place and then take my poly pen tool and just create a little bridge like so. Then I can connect this area as well, since that's a pretty obvious connection. And then I'll continue this loop all the way down. Right towards the jaw. And in this area where this meets, I'll go ahead and make another quad. That can be more of a diamond shaped quad. That actually ends up working quite well. All right, then I'll connect this area up at the top. And then I'd really like to continue following this area all the way down. So I'll just make a giant quad there that looks incredibly stretched, but we can go ahead and massage that later. What I'm really looking for is the loop that goes right under his cheekbone, just like so. So far that's looking good. And then we need to connect this area to the bottom, but it looks like we definitely need at least one more loop cut here. So let me separate this out a little bit and add one in with control R. I'll just hit G to move it. All right, then I'd like this area to follow the jaw muscle. So I'll connect that up like so, which gives us another quad that we can connect up towards the top. I'll follow that line down here. I'll create one more diamond quad to make that top vertex a pole and then fill in the remaining two quads. At this point, I noticed that I messed up a little bit and I have this loop that goes all the way down and kind of winds around back down towards the chin. And this sort of winding loop is something that I like to avoid and something that I definitely don't want in this case. What we can do is go ahead and delete one of these faces and then just add an extra vertex somewhere along this jawline and make this just go straight down the jaw. So I'll take the poly pen tool. I'll take this vertex right in the middle. That's that pole, which I don't need a pole in that area. I'll hit delete and vertices. And let's give this a little bit more breathing room. I'll go ahead and take these vertices down a little bit. Take this one off to the side and then control R add in another edge loop. Move those over. And now this will create some nice quads. I'll continue this on down towards the bottom. And maybe I'll add in one more edge loop here towards the side. Control R. Just like so. And there we have it. That's looking a lot better. Now I can go through and relax this area again. And use a large tweak tool in case I need to spread things out a little bit more. Again, my main goal here is just to trace a loop along the cheekbone and that jaw muscle. I also feel like I'm missing a loop down here where things are getting a little bit too cramped because if I take this vertex and kind of even it out with the top, then this becomes way too stretched. So what I can do is just add in another loop here as well by spacing this out a little bit more. And let's add that so that it goes down and around this way. To do that, I'll just delete this face here. Delete and faces, control R, add that loop in, and then also add a loop here towards the bottom. And add that diamond shape back in, and then fill in those quads. Okay, that works a little bit better. I'll even out the vertices along the jawline here.
and with a little more tweaking, then I think we can call this ready. Just as a test, let's see how well this subdivides, because that's the biggest concern with topology like this. I'll exit RetoboFlow real quick, tab into object mode, hit slash to go into local view so that I can actually see this, and then hit control two to add a subdivision surface modifier with level two. Right click and shade smooth, and so far that's looking good. I can get a rough guess on how it's going to deform if I go into edit mode, turn on proportional editing. Let's just use a smooth fall off here. Let's pull our cheeks back. You can see how those quads are going to crumple a little bit, but they're also going to crumple along the wrinkles of the face. We can also try manipulating the cheeks. And so far, I think this works pretty well. All right, let's finish this up by tabbing into edit mode here, hitting slash to exit local view, and returning to RetopoFlow. Again, making sure that we're in edit mode for our retopology object. We're getting a warning that we have some bad symmetry, meaning that we have some vertices on the wrong side of the symmetry line. But in this case, even if we have some that are just slightly over, that's not really a problem. We can easily snap them later. To finish this up, I'll just bring his forehead up a little bit. I'll even out these quads on top here. Maybe bring them down slightly, just like so. And then I can go to my strokes tool, double click, shift double click to select both of those loops and just draw a loop that goes up and all the way around. All right, then I'd like to create a junction down here above the brows so that we don't have quite so many vertices going up and over the head. So I'll use my poly pen tool, take this second edge, create a little angle, and then bring that in towards the center. Just like that, we've built a little bit of a bridge. Then I can take those two edges, connect them, just like that. Then to connect this with the rest, I can just select the edge loop that runs along, hold control, and then draw out from that top left vertex. just like so, maybe move these over to the left a little bit. Then I'll also select this center vertex and draw another stroke that goes all the way from the center all the way to the side. That'll give us a good distribution of quads to wrap over his head. I'll just straighten these up towards the side for now. Hold down Z and use my relax tool. The eyes and mouth, we can also finish up pretty easily with the strokes tool. I'll go ahead and double click to select the edge loop that goes all the way around what we have of the eyes so far. And I'll just draw a loop that goes around the eyelid itself. Then I'll hold shift and scroll up twice. We'll probably want to actually move these vertices into place to cover the major important areas of the eyelid because that creates a little bit of a bulge and we'll want some vertices in that crease there, which means we'll probably want yet another loop that goes around. So it'll be a little bit dense, but that's okay. We definitely want this area to deform well and we need enough vertices such that he can actually close his eyelids. So I'll create a little bit more space here as it goes around, just like that. Maybe move this one up and let's add in one more loop here. I'll do that with control R and left click. A little bit of vertex massaging later and we should be ready. Similarly for the lips, what I can do is select this bottom set of edges, trace along the top of his bottom lip all the way towards the center and then scroll up once just to add another cut. If we want to, then we can easily add another loop by going to our loops tool, maybe sliding that up a little bit, and then holding control and left clicking to add another one. Then let's do that same thing for the top lip. I'll select the same number of vertices. Let's see, down here we had six selected. So maybe I'll move this one over 
just a little bit like so. I'll select six vertices and trace the bottom. I'll hold shift and scroll up twice. All right, now we just need to connect these in this crevice. For that, I'll use poly pen, which is great for tight areas. I'll make one quad and connect that over. And then I can just use the patches tool. Select all of these edges, just like so. Maybe remove those. Use control, shift, and left click to toggle corners, and then hit F to fill. I'll go back to poly pen and select this vertex and just move it into place. All right, then I'll try to follow the corner of his mouth a little bit better there. All right. All right, that should work well enough for now. The last thing I'll do is just massage these vertices around his mouth. And really, I could go on tweaking all day, but for the purposes of this tutorial, I'll go ahead and call this finished. I'll hit exit to exit RetopaFlow, hit tab to go into object mode, again, slash to isolate it, and we can see the finished result of our work. Oh, and the mirror modifier doesn't have clipping enabled. Let's see, if I go to my workspace where I actually can see my modifiers, if I go to the mirror modifier, you can see clipping is disabled. And that's because in RetopaFlow, we set the merge distance to zero so that it wouldn't snap too closely to the center. But I can just go ahead and turn on clipping again, hit tab to go into edit mode, and just select this center line. Proportional editing, we don't need that. Move that in towards the center, snap that up, and there we go. Again, if we were to have the merge distance set to something like 0.001 in RetopaFlow, then we wouldn't have to worry about that and clipping would already be enabled. Oh, we also need to increase the merge distance. So 0 0.001, because the merge distance in RetopaFlow is gonna be the same as the mirror modifier. I'll right click and shade that smooth and we can see the result. I wasn't timing myself, so I'm not sure exactly how long the entire retopology process took for this face, but I think it was around an hour and a half, including the time that I stopped to explain things. Hopefully that was a good example of how quickly you can lay down topology in RetopaFlow and also change topology later if you need to. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you enjoy using Retopaflow.